episode of the Pakistan Experience. I'm not going to waste any time on introductions because you already know who, who Owen Bennett Jones is. We're here to discuss his new book, The Bhutto Dynasty. First of all, how are you doing, Owen? Very well. How are you? Good. Since we don't have a lot of time with you, I'm going to run through all of this. I do want to get to the book, but I would be remiss not to ask you your views on the current political turmoil in Pakistan. How do you see what is happening right now? Well, you'll know more than me. Uh, I'm I'm in London now, so I'm not following it minute by minute, as I'm sure you are. But it seems that uh, you know the uh, the established political forces are re-emerging, and that we'll be back to where we were before Imran Khan came onto the scene. I can't believe he'll make it that easy. But uh, anyway, I, I, I think you should be telling me what's happening. I see it uh, completely the opposite way that you do. So let's just jump straight into your book and let's start where the book starts. I think the first chapter is quite evocative. As somebody who lived through that, who was in Karachi, who witnessed the bloodshed, who got caught in the middle of the uh, violence on the streets, I think the death of Benazir um, is a moment in time for almost every Pakistani. Uh, so the big question, I'll ask you the big question straight up, who killed Benazir? Well, she was killed by a 15-year-old boy called Bilal. Uh, not much is known about him. It is an astonishing fact that uh, the police, I think, never even interviewed his family or made any effort to contact them in the way that Pakistanis view politics. Perhaps that's not so surprising. He was seen as a tool, which is what he was, of uh, greater forces, so people didn't pay much attention to him. But nonetheless, it is an extraordinary fact. His Parts of his body ended up in Cambridge, rather oddly, as um, uh, the investigators asked British scientists to uh, examine the remains of Bilal, which they did and established he probably was 15 years old. So that's who killed him. He was um, trained as a suicide bomber in those years when that was so uh, common in Pakistan by uh, the TTP. And the TTP helped organize the killing uh, as they had organized the first attack in Karachi that you mentioned. So that much is clear. It's also pretty clear that Al-Qaeda was involved in um, commissioning this attack, that uh, bin Laden, or at least his top people, were aware it was coming and had had an interest in it and had given their support to the idea and thought they could get some uh, credit out of it. It was a time when Al-Qaeda was on the back foot and uh, this was seen as a way of uh, claiming an attack which uh, they could get some credit for, even though the Taliban were the ones who would actually do all the work. So uh, those two organizations were involved. And of course, you know, the next question is, did they have the support and facilitation of the Pakistani state? Uh, I can't say that uh, they did, but I, I, I suspect there were elements of the state who were aware of the plot and who uh, let it go by or it maybe even facilitated it. So the introduction of the book deals with all the emotions of it, but when we do actually get on the chapter on the assassination, you do leave all these puzzle pieces without actually saying it. The puzzle pieces are all there for somebody to put together. So if we are to make a case, um, the idea, the, first of all, the idea that it was hosed down. So the Z's is on record on in private and public and through my sources as well, he is still on record saying he acted alone. But the UN Commission that you talk about, they also find it unbelievable. And I believe it was General Nadeem who went on record saying he was the one who ordered Saud Aziz to hose uh, the crime scene down. How big of stupidity almost is it to hose down a crime scene? Is it enough to at least be skeptical and think of culpability when such an action is com uh, committed? Well, I mean, I don't think it's just, I mean, the hosing down of the crime scene is, is um, symbolic of a wider cover-up, uh, and clearly there was a cover-up, and uh, the UN investigators speak quite openly about the fact that they were frustrated in their investigation, the Pakistani state was obstructing their work, uh, and there are many other aspects to the cover-up. Most of the people involved in the plot to kill Benazir were murdered in various forms over the few weeks and months that came after uh, her death. So, uh, yeah, the cover-up was far-reaching, comprehensive, consistent, and definitely involved the civilian and military 
sides of the government. Uh, Rahman Malik clearly was orchestrating it. And uh, you know, who was asking him to do it? I don't, I don't think it's too difficult to guess. So you know, one of the issues that came up is why didn't Asif Sadari, as president, investigate his wife's murder with greater enthusiasm? I mean, for what it's worth, my understanding of that, but it's difficult to prove anything. And he denied it to me when I asked him. But nonetheless, it would seem to me that he probably reached an accommodation with the military that he would not be investigating this murder if his route to the presidency was clear. So, uh, you know, lots of people didn't want to know who killed Benazir. It's a shocking fact. I mean, for all her faults, and you know, she had faults which were quite significant. The fact is, she was an important person in Pakistani history. She had a popular base. She had a role to play, and uh, no one, even her close family, were interested in the question of who killed her. Uh, reading about all the people that were killed close to the investigation, maybe I should be looking over my shoulder after asking these questions. But since you did mention Rahman Malik, right at the start of the book, you mentioned how Rahman Malik first said that he acted alone in fleeing the crime scene. And then he said the police told him to flee the crime scene. And it's almost uh, evocative or symbolic or representative of what happened to Qaidi Azam as well. The founder of the nation uh, could not get an ambulance. And then it baffles the mind to think that the most popular leader of the time in Pakistan, Benazir Bhutto, uh, Nahid had to hail a taxi in an attempt to get her to the hospital. We think about all the resources of the party and the state, and it came to a point where Benazir was dying and they did not have a car to take her to the hospital. It is an extraordinary fact. It is exactly how it happened, what you described, and it is shocking. And it is uh, to the great discredit of the police. Well, they would probably say they had no choice. They're acting on orders not to be there. But certainly for the close colleagues of Benazir who abandoned her in her time of need, it is utterly shocking. So since you had already mentioned Zadari, that's what the national narrative is. It probably a lot of it stems on from Musharraf's statement when he was asked, since he was the primary accused, at least that's what Benazi said as well, uh, especially in the letter that she wrote to Wolf Blitzer, he is who is named, or at least added to the names. Musharraf's statement was asked, Zadari, he benefited the most. And now the national almost narrative is Zadari killed his wife. Is there any truth to that apart from the fact that he became president? No truth at all, in my view. No evidence for it at all. Uh, I think he failed to investigate the murder, but there is no reason to believe, in my view, that he was uh, involved in the plot to kill her in, in, in any form. No, I mean, I just, you know, I've looked at it very closely uh, over a period of some years, and I've just never seen anything that indicates that's the case. So you did uh, give a cursory mention to that. A lot of uh, social media experts, uh, as I would pejoratively call them, uh, mentioned the fact that he did not ask for a postmortem. But I also agree with you. What good would have post a postmortem done? It was quite clear what killed him. Right. Yeah, it's quite clear. I mean, I'm sure there are cultural reasons why he uh, may not have wanted a postmortem too. But it's a matter of very limited significance. Uh, it, it got a lot of coverage, but I just don't think. That the I, I I accept what you say that most Pakistanis seem to think he was involved, uh, but I you know again I just don't think he was. If we do go back in time, Fatma Bhutto is on the record saying that Zadari was involved in the murder of Murtaza Bhutto. Do you find any credence to that claim? Well, I mean that is a highly controversial thing to say. I mean clearly uh, it's never been resolved. Uh, there were some very strange things going on that weekend. Uh, I have looked at that, and uh, yeah, I, I, I think that you know, there are questions to be asked about that, actually. But I, I again, I mean, I can't say it with authority, um, and I suspect at this stage no one ever will be able to. But just to put it at its most general, it would seem to me that uh, Murtaza Bhutto was at that point a genuine problem for Benazir and her supporters uh, because he was on a path of confrontation, political confrontation, basically, and, and, and with the mother supporting him. So it was sort of unsustainable and, and, and attempts had been made to broker a deal between uh, Benazir and Murtaza, which failed, you know, and ended up with an acrimonious shouting match. So I can see that uh, people who are loyal to Benazir may have thought that this, need, this had to be resolved in a way because it was not being resolved through talking. 
so you know I think the circumstances are were highly unusual and uh you know clearly he was shot you know clearly he was murdered uh, someone had to give the order even while you're raising suspic suspicion you're falling short of saying Benazir was involved because I don't know because I, I don't know I mean you know I, I, I'm a journalist even while too. suspecting it because even yeah, close I mean, to Benazir they also think there's no way the sister could have been involved I well I agree with that I mean from what I've seen th there is very little evidence that she knew about it and yeah I think she, there is evidence she was genuinely shocked you know when when she found out what had happened and extremely distressed uh, so you know you could say that was all put on I mean the point is I yeah in all these cases I'm doing it, it I mean it's, I'm a victim of 30 years of BBC training and I know that there are plenty of Pakistanis who think the BBC is a Western imperialist colonialist. Is it not? Right. Is it not the oven? <laughs> <laughs> is it not? Uh, so anyway, all I can tell you is, I, I in my in my training uh, and uh, work, it, you know, I just never tried. I mean, I always tried not to say things that I couldn't back up and say were true, and and uh, you know, that is the whole currency of someone like me is credibility mm -hmm. and not making wild claims. So I'm, you know, I don't know uh, whether. The state was involved in supporting Benazir's murder. I just don't know. Uh, I mean, I've got suspicions and I've got question marks and little bits of evidence here and there, but I can't reach a conclusion. And the same is true of Murdoch's death. I just don't know. Uh, and I, I don't see why I shouldn't say so. It's quite strange that Benazir was prime minister when Murtaza was killed and Zadari, yes, was, yes. Zadari yeah. became president uh, right after Benazir's death. Mm -hmm. And those both those investigations led to not much. Uh, I believe you're not closely looking at Imran Khan and everything that he says, but he's comparing himself to Bhutto. And I'm sure you're aware of the American conspiracy to oust him. I'm not going to get your take on that. But you also are a little dismissive of the idea that the US was involved. Maybe it's because there's no credible evidence for that. And a lot of it is illusions or it's statements that uh, Benazir said or statements which were said to Zutkar Ali Bhutto in private. Do you pay any credence to the idea that the US were involved, or is just that they looked the other way and did not intervene? So in the murder of her father, uh, Zulkarni Yes. Um, well, I, I've, you know, I, I would think by now, uh, had there been US involvement in that, we would have uh, heard about it. Uh, nothing, no one involved has given a hint yeah, in, in, by which I mean involved in American South Asian relations at that time, you know, in Washington, no one's given a hint that that was the case. Uh, the the whole thing seems to rest on Benazir's memory of hearing Kissinger say, "I'll make an example of you if you don't get rid of the bomb." Uh, you know, that was one remark which we simply don't know the context of, and. Furthermore, there is every reason to think that General Zia wanted him killed, you know, and that uh, General Zia saw him as a rival and, you know, all this, you know, the whole story of Zia and, and Bhutto. And, and I don't see why there's any need to explain it in more complicated terms. I mean, you know, the, the, the propensity of not just Pakistanis, but many political analysts to come up with these conspiracy theories is... Uh, very telling. I, I, you know, I, I'm not a, someone who dismisses conspiracy theories out of hand. I know it's quite often said, oh, it's always a cock up, not a conspiracy. I mean, I don't think that. I think quite often people in power are malign and they do do dirty things and they do cover it up. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying there never are conspiracies, but I've, I've never seen any evidence that Zadari was involved in his wife's murder. I've never seen any evidence that the US was involved in Bhutto's hanging. And, and I just sort of think that people who make these claims you know, what's the point of it? I mean, it, it's not terribly clever to say, oh, you know, the US didn't like him, so he killed him. I mean, that's it, really. That's the case. It's just a bit lame. And, and you've got to do better than that and come up with some evidence. I think uh, healthy skepticism about US involvement in domestic politics in other countries and regime change uh, is often well placed, even though I don't think it is in the case of Imran Khan. You do mention how much the US was involved, almost to the extent of interfering in the internal matters of Pakistan when it came to providing protection, not directly, they fell short of providing direct protection that you talk about how Benazir asked for it, but they were quite clear on ensuring and asking the state 
we don't see any of that in the cases of Zulfikar Bildu. So at the very least, they did now, look hold on, I don't get the, No, no, no. You're, you're, I think you're, you're confusing two things. I mean, in, in the first case, uh, Benazir asked for US physical protection when she came back to Karachi. And the Americans ambassador in a wiki leaked document said quite sensibly look if we say we'll protect her we're going to end up saying something like don't go to that rally because you're going to get killed and she's going to go anyway so why would we protect her she's not going to listen to us so there's not much point offering her protection so i mean that seemed to me a perfectly sensible uh, statement you know policy advice from the ambassador which which washington Followed. I'm sure there was more to it than that, and Cheney was supporting Musharraf, and there were lots of things going on. But you know, there was quite a good reason for the U.S. not to send security personnel on the ground to protect her. And I, I, don't, I don't see the parallel with Zulfikar so, at all. Just the parallel that I'm drawing is you also mentioned multiple times. The U.S. did pressurize, or at least help broker a deal in ensuring that Benazir comes back to Pakistan. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. So she comes back. So the US was involved in domestic politics when it comes to that. And oftentimes people in high places, whether it's through diplomats, do test the waters. So maybe the waters were tested and the idea from the US was we would not interfere. Whereas in, in other cases, they have interfered to ensure that a safe exit uh, well, is given I, um, to, to okay, politicians. I mean, you know, it's possible. It, you don't have any evidence. Uh, I, 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 you know, my reading of Pakistani politics is that a decision to kill a former prime minister would not be communicated to the Americans in any channel whatsoever. I mean, it's an extraordinary thing to put to to um, the Americans, and that. If there were elements of the state involved, I'm not even sure the senior leadership in Pakistan would have known about it, never mind the American leadership. Uh, so, yeah, my reading of Pakistani politics perhaps is rather different to you, but neither of us know, I guess. Uh, again, I think we're headed towards conjecture, so let's stop discussing yeah, sure, uh, exactly. about this. Uh, I think the entire nation, even his worst critics, do respect Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto for bravely walking to the gallows are not taking a safe exit. At least it's widely reported that he had the option of exile and he chose to stay. But you talk about how, whether it's his narcissism or it's or he was just naive, till he did not have the noose around his neck, he truly did not believe that he would be hanged. I think that's true. That he Well, I think the realization came to him late in the evening. The, of, you know, and, and he was late in the evening so let's say six hours before he was killed, something like that, uh, when he finally understood that Zia was going to do it and asked one of the prison guards, are you really doing it tonight? And the guard said, yes. And he asked again. Uh, and in fact, he did it in physical form. He just uh, sort of drew his hand across his neck and the guard nodded. And... Uh, then Bhutto realized it was going to happen and, and, and in fact, you know, w was physically affected by that uh, and found it difficult. So, so, yes, I mean, I think, I don't know whether it's narcissism, maybe a bit of narcissism, his understanding of Pakistani politics. Uh, he thought that everything was negotiable and that Zia wouldn't dare do it, um, but he misread it, actually. And, and uh, it happened. I mean, I don't want to take away from the courage that he showed and his daughter showed, you know, the most astonishing courage, because um, clearly he could have left, you know, I mean, he could have cut, his, cut, cut, cut a deal earlier and left. Uh, but he, he, I think it's true to say that when he was negotiating, he, he did it on the basis that Zia wouldn't dare do it. Even uh, Nusrat Bhutto, I think at a time, even uh, all the things that you said uh, about their past relationship and all the domestic issues that they might have had, I think the courage shown by Nusrat Bhutto in that moment and after that uh, speaks volumes. Uh, the fact that that happened to Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, what happened to BNC Bhutto, what happened to Murtaza Bhutto, what even happened to Shanavaz Bhutto, who was at that point not an active threat. What do you think uh, is it that the Bhuttos were at least seen as such a threat to somebody? Uh, Sharifs at many places 
have gone even further in their anti-army stances in the by both by their actions and their words is it just their anti-establishment anti-military stance or their fraught relationships with certain military personnel which has made the story of the Bhutto so tragic or is there more to that story um that's a good question i've not really thought about it like that before and that's interesting i mean i i would i guess you have to look at each individual case and say that the murders of murder you know was well, possibly and likely an internal family squabble rather than the state. And it, I mean, it, no, no one's really thinking the state had an interest in killing murders of Bhutto. So, you know, from the colonial days on, it was said that the Bhutto's were very disputatious, you know, they're all, always arguing with each other. Uh, so I think that's added. And, and, you know, the word deaths before this, I mean, this is not just, this didn't just start with. Zulfikari Bhutto or Murtis of Bhutto, it goes back to the colonial days when, uh, you know, one of the early Bhutto landowners in, in Sindh was poisoned and another one uh, was killed, I can't quite remember how, uh, one, of, one of the cousins was, was, was murdered very young, despite being a massive landowner and very well set in life. So, I mean, it has been going a long time. So I think, I think there's family internal disputes to some extent, uh, but Yes, I, mean, I, I guess you just have to look at it in each individual case. I don't know if you can draw a conclusion. I mean, Zulfa Ghali Bhutto clearly did challenge the military in a way they found unacceptable. Benazir, I think it was slightly different. I think she was mistrusted. My theory, but again, I can't prove it, is that she was uh, the nuclear issue probably undid her and that uh, you know, some people in Pakistan couldn't tolerate that and, and saw it as a supreme national interest, which they had to defend. Uh, so I guess I would tend more to look at the individual circumstances of each each case. So the idea that there is an institutional distrust of the family that runs through generations, and I think it's repeatedly said uh, that the institution of the army of the established in Pakistan is like an elephant and has a long memory. I'm not sure if elephants do or not, mm -hmm. but as far as metaphors go, that is what is said. So whether it's Punjab ethnocentrism, whether it's general distrust out of generations, uh, you don't see that there is an institutional distrust of the family. No, I do. I do see there's a distrust. I don't know whether it's a murderous distrust, you know. I mean, I, I mean cl clearly there is a great hostility to the family. And, uh, you know, there are many military people who don't want to talk about the Bhutos at all. If you're a journalist asking for interviews, they just go, I don't want to talk about them. I don't like them. You know, and, and the sheriff clearly didn't like them. And, and many, many uh, military leaders, you know, do not like the Bhutos. They see them as corrupt and self interested. and uh you know uh, feudal and lots of other things so i'm sure they uh, see all civilians as that some of them do at least yeah probably but i mean i, I guess there are degrees of uh, degrees of of, of uh, contempt yeah i think what you mentioned the quote by roy Dat khan i think that really does encapsulate the institutional policy as much as one can say it's an institutional policy about what they think of being and it's almost tragic that that is what kids grow up thinking about that woman without actually thinking about the, the, the his, historical context that she became prime minister in and the struggles that she had. She was by no means perfect, but the idea mm. that she was just this corrupt lady who was terrible mm. for Pakistan and a mm. traitor, I think it's quite unfair a portrayal. Yeah, there's more to it than that. I mean, that's the point. And, 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 and uh, she died incredibly bravely and, and her death had meaning. It was a moment of protest and resistance in favor of uh, democratic change and liberal values. And she knew her likely fate and she accepted it. And that is something that is more than most of us could manage to do. And uh, I think therefore people who you know, lack that kind of courage in which I'd include myself, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I wouldn't have the guts to do what she did. Uh, and, and I think she did it you know, she had her personal motives, no doubt, but she also did it in the service of broader ideas, uh, which uh, remain important to many Pakistanis. And to that extent, she is a symbol of those ideas. And uh, so, so it should be. You also described her death as, as a redemption. It's almost a redemption for Benazir herself. It would, I would love for you to expand on that idea. You see that Benazir almost saw this as a calling of history and maybe a way of what you call redemption, a redemption of her personal feelings the first time? Yeah, I think she lived a life which you know, was disappointing to some extent. I mean, she, you know, many Pakistanis feel she didn't fulfill 
the hopes they placed in her as a young woman when she first came to power. And, you know, I, I, having studied this, I, I came to understand more all these issues about the money and how it began, probably, I think, as a political necessity, really. I mean, you know, I'm not trying to justify it, but you can see why they got themselves into the position where they felt they needed to raise money to basically keep their supporters loyal and to buy buy you know, to, to outbid their opponents if you like so so i could see how the money came into it in the first instance and then probably there was some more personal uh, corrupt practice later on which is of course impossible uh, to justify but anyway all that story which is so familiar to so many pakistanis was there and yet in her death, she moved, I think she rose above that. Uh, and she did redeem herself. And those failings looked, you know, in, let's put it like this, they look, look much less important and much less significant as part of her whole story when you consider how she, how her life ended and how bravely she marched towards her death. When we do look at her political legacy, specifically her time as prime minister, what would you say to the idea that after a decade of Ziaul Haq, uh, Benazir was instrumental, at least from a public standpoint, in bringing down Ziaul Haq finally? What would you say to the idea that after a decade of military rule, with the military entrenched in every single institution, uh, a president who was not cooperative, to say the least, to a government and a political ri rival in the biggest province uh, of the country, which controls most of Pakistan. How much power did Benazir truly have, even in her short stints as prime minister, which were both less than a couple of years? Uh, well, not much, uh, as you just implied. And I, mean, I actually think the you know, responsibility for the failure to confront the military and to um, assert civilian power and legitimacy was really more her father's than hers, because you know, he did have a great opportunity after 1971 to do that. The army were clearly on the back foot. Uh, he was immensely popular. And had he played it differently, I think he could have asserted civilian uh, power uh, in the face of military power. And Pakistan's history might have been rather different. But by the time it got to uh, Benazir being in power, the, the, the state, you know, the, the, the systems had already set and it was already clear that the military were there and that anyone who, who wants to govern as a civilian ruler will just have to do what they want. So Zafikari Bhutto paid for his life for doing what little he did. You genuinely feel like had he done a lot more right after 1971, he would have been able to do it. Well, it's interesting because I mean, he tried in a way. I mean, he, 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 he provoked the army at that time and he completely distrusted them. And, and he did you know, provoke them by, for example, putting that TV footage of the surrender in, in Dhaka on the TV the whole time. So he was needling away at the military and uh, irritating them that probably that wasn't the right way to manage it. I mean, what he needed to do was build institutions that could have um, withstood uh, the pressure from, uh, you know, challenges to their to, to, to civilian power. So, you know, he needed a strong parliament, he needed a strong civil service, he needed these various uh, bodies to establish themselves and to um, you know, assert themselves as, as elements of a democratic setup, which she, which she didn't do. And, and I think that's, a, that's disappointing. I'm as critical of, as anybody of our civil leaders of not establishing civilian supremacy and often acting dictatorially themselves. But I'm also curious, how does a civilian prime minister stand up against a literal army at the end of the day? I'm just saying there was an opportunity in 71 because the army was so on the back foot. I mean, that, you know, put it like this. If it was ever going to happen, that was probably the, the year of 1971, 72, let's say, was the time to do it. Uh, and, you know, clearly it didn't happen. And I'm not saying Bhutto didn't try, but uh, and I'm not saying if I'd be maybe if I'd been there, I couldn't have done any better. But th that was the moment. I mean, by the time it got to Benazir's first term, it, it, there was no chance of doing anything like that. Uh, I mean, Zadari tried uh, after bin Laden and then failed. That you all that's should true. talk about in quite right detail that's in your book. Yeah, that's true. Uh, on the subject of 1971 as well, you talk in quite detail about the triangle of uh, the three people who were involved. But again, since history is manipulated a lot in Pakistan, 
Uh, most of the fall is on Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto and often in public discourse, what people say is Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto is the reason we lost half the country, whereas the milit military dictators tend to go scotch free uh, and are not attributed as much blame as they probably should be. Uh, what is your opinion on that? Well, it's a very complicated issue. And, and in a way, I mean, I think it would be quite an interesting book in itself, that three way struggle between uh, Yaya Mujib Rahman and, and, and Sulfur Ali Bhutto. And I think, yeah, they all played their part, frankly. I mean, yeah, and of course, the man who was mainly responsible was, 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 was Mujib Rahman, right? That's, because that's what he wanted, and what he struggled for, and is what he got. So, so you know, you, you, you can look at it that way, that there, there were those much clearer lines of responsibility, if you like, uh, for what happened. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think uh, Sulfur Ali Bhutto's decision not to attend the parliament National Assembly was an important moment in what had happened. And uh, yeah, I, 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 I think there's a lot of blame to go around and all, th all three of the main uh, protagonists can take a bit of it. Well, what would you see to this idea that Zulfikar Bhutto, as somebody who only had a majority in West Pakistan, could have actually ordered the military? I'm assuming the military was still under military control and not under Zulfikar Bhutto's control. I don't think anyone's suggesting he ordered the military. That's, the question that's, I think that's the popular discourse in Pakistan, that he's the one who ordered the massacres. Oh, well, I mean, it's, 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 I mean, it's, it's not that. It's a question of whether he could have done more to, re, to, to help achieve a political settlement. And, and, you know, you can make that case. Uh, would Majiba Rahman have ever gone for it? Uh, yeah, you can make the case that he would have done. Uh, I don't think anyone would say that such a settlement would have held for any length of time. You know, I mean, the the the, the, the forces in favour of uh, the split were greater than these politicians at the end, probably. So even if it didn't happen in seventy one, it probably happened in seventy two or seventy three. But I, no, I mean, I, I, the the issue is, as far as I'm concerned, what wh whether the West Pakistani leadership could have taken the East Pakistani demands more seriously and, and fashioned a compromise. Uh, and yeah, there is there is some evidence that Majibur Rahman, Rahman would have settled for that and, and some that he wouldn't, um, but you could make the case. Yeah, I think Anam Zakaria writes about this question of inevitability. Maybe it was inevitable, the creation of Bangladesh, but hopefully mm -hmm. a lot more amicably, if there was a political solution, what people would report uh, who were involved in the meetings, and I think the Fikali Bhutto is also on record saying that four or five of the six demands were already accepted. And even on the mm -hmm. question of Mujibur Rahman, how Aisha Jalal argues in this whole sole spokesman that Kaide Azam was using it as a negotiating tool that uh, mm -hmm. Pakistan was a bargaining chip. So maybe one can argue for Mujibur Rahman as well. If Mujibur Rahman and Zulfikari Bhutto were close to a political settlement while the troops were already moving in, whether Zulfikari Bhutto knew and was buying time for the military or the military. I've, did never, not I've, really never, seen, I've never seen any evidence of that. Of them, uh, of, of, of it being reported that a political settlement was close between Mujib Rahman and Zulfikari Bhutto, because that has well, been. Well, I, I, don't, I don't think it was terribly close, but I've certainly not seen any evidence that he was doing it as a cynical, you know, when he went to Dhaka, that he was doing it as a cynical operation to buy time for the army. I, just, but, I, I mean, the, ar the army must have known that the negotiations would mean for nothing if they were already preparing for war. Well, I mean, yeah, but you prepare for war the whole time. I mean, the question is, you don't do the final order until you do the final order. And, and uh, yeah, so, I mean, I, 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 yeah, you, you, you can't say think that the decision had been taken until it's taken. Uh, since we, we, we touched upon Memogate, uh, hmm. we, right now, the, the, the popular belief, at least, is that Zadari has again struck a deal with the establishment, which is why the opposition is coming back into power. So if we do think about, uh, you know, what I mentioned, I might be contradicting myself about the establishment having a long memory. Uh, essentially, the assertion or the army or the establishment's belief in memo create is that Zadari was conspiring with the US to undermine the role of the military. But the wheeler dealer that Zadari is rumored to be, he's back in the good books of the military. So, sorry, so what's your question? Uh, that the institutional memory idea, maybe it doesn't hold true because Zadari in Memogate, at least in the mind of the military, was colluding with the US to undermine the military. And now Zadari and military are back together. 
Yeah, well, yes. I mean, I, there's another way of looking at it, which is that over the five years of the Zadari presidency, um, you know, he was extremely accommodating uh, with the military. And I, I take your point that uh, that that could the memo gate could have been an obstacle um, to to what's happening. But we don't really. I mean, I at least I don't know. Maybe you do. I don't know how much of this is to do with Zadari reaching. An accommodation or the Sharif's reaching an accommodation, I don't know. Uh, on the question of corruption charges against Zadari, uh, at this point, it would be hard to convince any Pakistani of otherwise. What's your take on this popular notion that Zadari is corrupt and that he's Mr. 10%? Well, I mean, the fact is there was a case in Switzerland, which... Um... Nicholas. Sorry? The necklace, the necklace. one thousand. Well, it wasn't just the necklace, but yeah, the, the, yes, let's say the necklace case, but other bits of it, uh, in which they were found guilty. You know, they were. Uh, now, what actually happened was that um, they didn't cooperate with the process, and so had the right, since they hadn't appeared in that trial, had the right to demand a further trial, which they did, and it was going to happen in Lausanne shortly before the. National reconciliation order was agreed. So, actually, there was an international uh, process which resulted in a clear decision of the magistrate in Geneva, uh, although it was subject to appeal and further process. So, in a way, it wasn't concluded in that way, but it, it nonetheless happened. Uh, so, that is the clearest case to date, which um, helps answer your question. Uh, I know we're, we're running out of time, so I'm going to run through a lot of these questions that people had. One of our regular listeners, Mohi Abro, says that as a kid, I remember watching BBC News and him reporting live on the October 99 coup by Musharraf. you got to ask him about it. How did he know what was happening? Where was he? Um, I, I did get to know about that a little early because I, um, I was in the BBC house when someone very kindly rang from PTV to say um, that there were soldiers in in the in the newsroom i think it was uh so that if i was i'd be very well advised to get down to the tv station and see what happened so i did do that and took my cameraman with me so i was able to film the soldiers climbing over the gate uh which i must admit was a little bit of a uh, a scoop you know quite quite uh, interesting quite a seminal get. photograph in our history yeah, yeah, quite good. Yeah. So, so it was, um, it was all down to someone being very nice in PTV and just giving me the, the heads up. I think Declan Welch, Walsh has also spoken about being, uh, especially in his book, the new book, uh, about how he was asked unceremoniously to leave. Uh, have you had such encounters with people where they've uh, suggested you stop investigating? Um, well, it's it's always tricky. I mean, you know, we, as foreign correspondents in Pakistan, we're totally dependent on visas, and and it, you know, Declan's had trouble, and a lot a lot of people have had trouble. I mean, I've I've gone through periods when visas have been harder to get and easier to get, and uh, it does seem to change a bit, you know, depending who's in power and what they're thinking and what reports you've just done. Uh, so yeah, it is it's a stressy issue, but I've never been kicked out yet. It's it's interesting how Pakistan works. If somebody was to make a Netflix series, even that anecdote about the UN, U, UN Commission report uh, members feeling like PIA flights were just cancelled so yeah. that they couldn't get to places. Yeah. At least yeah. we're creative about these things. Uh, his, <laughs> his views on why Bhutto declared Ahmadi is non-Muslims. You do talk about Bhutto's father again, whether it was political expediency, but at least he's on record saying things about Hindus, which are uh, less than ideal. But Zulfikari Bhutto saw himself as a secretarian, uh, or at least as a secular uh, politician. Is it just the pressure from the army and the religious opposition that he declared him he's non-Muslim? Well, I don't think it was pressure from the army. I mean, it, it, he was trying to win uh, support of the religious elements of Pakistani society and the clerics and so on, so as to remain in power. He could see that many of his support bases were being eroded and so uh, made this rather futile effort to win over uh, hardline religious opinion. And there were various other measures, weren't there, about drink and casinos and all the rest of it, and uh, all completely ridiculous. I mean, it was never going to make any difference to them. Uh, but nonetheless, that was his miscalculation. 
um maybe this is a much longer question but it's about the idea of ppb's branding as a left leaning party and somehow ppb has always existed in these two worlds in this peer muridi culture of feudal landlords and these marxist ideas and uh, this notion that zulfikar ali bhutto would have been the charismatic leader to maybe mubashir hasan's ideas or j j rahim's visions how do you see ppb and both these realities existing together well i think it started off as a socialist party in the sense that the senior leaders including zulfikar ali bhutto were interested and excited about left wing ideas i think rahim had been in paris hadn't he is was he ambassador or deputy ambassador or something he was in the in the embassy the pakistan embassy there um, maybe he was quite junior i don't know but he was he was there uh, and he saw the protests the left wing protests on the streets of paris in the late 60s mid 60s late 60s and yeah he was inspired by it and and thought that change was coming and that there was a have you know something he could take to pakistan and convince sulfa gali bhutto that this was uh, you know an ideology that could benefit pakistan and that maybe whose time had come uh, so to that extent there was a socialist impulse at the beginning but clearly uh, as is the case in so many socialist parties you know it proved difficult when power came to live up to those ideas and uh, very soon uh, the ideology was eroded uh, yeah and coupled with which and again this is a familiar problem you know Zulfa Ali Bhutto lived a a wealthy lifestyle you know he, he was a rich guy and uh, he didn't mind splashing his money so uh, to that extent that was a contradiction as well with his uh, ideology and then exactly the same thing happened with Benazir who Tariq Ali you say you've had on the podcast a few times i mean was quite hopeful at the beginning that Benazir was a radical leader and would become a radical leader but uh, she made the compromises that so many people who start on the left of politics do and uh, found that as she was in power she was unable to enact some of the ideas she'd had earlier and uh, by the end was i think telling Tariq Ali as i understand it look times have moved on i've had to change my ideas and i don't want to be out of step with the current thinking in world opinion if you like and it's not hardline socialism so so you know i think it was genuine at the beginning but it did erode any validity to the claim that benazir truly did try and increase the budget for social welfare programs and reduce the budget for army but obviously she would never have been able to do that uh, i actually don't know the answer to that i think mean, I'd, i'd like to know the answer to that but um, if you find out you can tell me is there any chance of zazari leaving the party for bilawal on his own for bilawal yes leaving the party for bilawal well i yikes uh again I, i don't know i mean you have to i mean obviously balal will run the party at some point uh so i guess you're talking about the next few months aren't you as to whether aren't you i don't know i mean why do they yeah well i mean uh health will come into it and um it, you know there must be a time when he has to relinquish but i i i mean I, i guess the only useful thing to say is that from what i've seen you know bilal is very much uh, listening to his father and respectful of his father and is uh, not asserting himself as the the leader at this point anyway you've also completely quashed the claim that people make that the letter been as he wrote handing over the party to zardari was forged i spent a lot of time uh, trying to prove the opposite and uh, i thought maybe it was uh, questionable and even found a man who i thought may have forged it and spent a lot of time running around after him but uh, no i i i i am convinced for a couple of reasons that it's real first because the handwriting is hers and people who are familiar with the handwriting also it's hers and handwriting experts say it says but not just that the, the night before she left for karachi she had a dinner in washington with uh, hasan akani and his wife and uh, sadari and said uh, at that dinner look if i get killed if anything happens to me uh asif will have to take over because bilal's too young you know he's still at university and he's not ready uh and so there'll have to be a period where asif takes over the party while bilal uh, prepares himself to to take over after that so i mean it, 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 given that i do think that conversation happened then it follows that the will makes complete sense I mean your book is called the Bhutto dynasty and you're critical of dynasties and all of us are critical of dynasties but when you were talking to Hussein Haqqani uh 
he raised a very interesting point that uh, Zulfikar Bhutto was probably right about his own lieutenants because after his death they all turned and they became uh, a part of the establishment, whether it's the Jatois, whether it's the Khars. So this idea that Hussein Hatani raised, I think you never got a chance to respond to that. So I'd like to pose it to you again, that maybe dynasties exist because the trust factor beyond the family is so little and the pull of the establishment towards anybody who's not loyal by blood is, is so great that there is that inherent distrust of anybody outside the family. That's interesting, interesting idea i mean it, it, it it's so striking that so many institutions in pakistan are run on a dynastic principle you know i mean it's not just the pml n and the ppp and it's also other political parties i mean even uh you know the the lao masjid in islamabad you know the leadership of that dynastic i mean so many things are dynastic that it, it is to some extent, just part of the cultural life of Pakistan, I guess, you know, that that, that this phenomenon exists and that it, it is a sort of expected. I, I think it's also worth saying that it's not so different to other political systems, you know, the Bushes and the Clintons. And I mean, in part, British Parliament, it is very striking how many members of Parliament are related to each other. I mean, it's true. And there are obvious reasons why that happens, because they can help each other get these positions of influence and they know how to do it and they have the contacts and they have the confidence and they have the resources. So, you know, I don't think Pakistan is such an outlier in this, but it is nonetheless very marked aspect of Pakistani political culture. Uh, a lot of people also report that Zadari and Benazir were almost on the verge of divorce before a murder. Is that also just rumours? I think it's rumours, yes. I don't think she would ever would have uh, divorced him and was uh, everyone who I know who was close to her yeah, it has led me to believe that she, she was, uh, you know, she just, it was not within her makeup to divorce. And um, even if they'd lived apart a bit, she wouldn't have divorced. Uh, also, uh, any credence to the claims that senior PPP leadership was actually quite disappointed at BNZ treating the party as a personal heirloom and handing it over to her husband and uh, her son, rather than actually quite competent senior PPP leadership. Well, they've never dared say it. I'm sure they must they must think it. Um, but you know <laughs> yeah. I've never heard anyone articulate that view, but I have suspected they're thinking it, yeah. How how do you see the future of uh, the Bhutto's or at least PPP? Well, uh, so it depends on two things, the relationship with the military and you know, their managing of the high-level politics, if you like, um army, other political parties and so on. But it also has to depend on their base and and how many votes they can mobilize, you know, and, and it always seems to me that Pakistani politics, you know, by which I mean the mainstream political civilian politics, you know, it doesn't follow election results to the letter, as it were, and election results can be fixed and all that. But, it, but, but it's still important that a party has, you know, broad support or not. And, you know, the fact that the PMLN now probably does have a lot of support in Punjab is relevant and it makes a difference and it means it means something. It's not just an irrelevance. Uh, and, and so I think that's true for the PPP. And, you know, the, the circumstances of that first election after 2007 were so propitious for the PPP after her death and the sympathy they had at that time was so great that you, you really could see that as a high point of their electoral chances. And it's not quite enough, you know, uh, and, and it gets eroded. And and so the, at the moment, the votes just aren't there. And I mean, I don't know if Bilal can do anything about that. I, I, I haven't seen that he can. I mean, I think it must be very difficult for him to work out what to do. Uh, what would you say to the idea that Zadari's presidency entrenched Zadari as the center or the locus of power and his philosophy as the philosophy of PPP as opposed to at least on paper what we would call the Bhutto doctrine. Well, as, I don't know about in policy terms, but in, in sort of power terms, it seems to me that he did flirt with the idea of trying to create a Zadari dynasty rather than a Bhutto dynasty and that it didn't work, you know, and, he, and he's a pragmatic guy and he realized it wasn't going to work and, and dropped it. Uh, and that's in a way his great political strength, isn't it? That he can 
he can adapt when he sees something's an impossible obstacle. He just goes, oh, fine, well, whatever, <laughs> moves on to the next thing, which yeah, not everyone can do. Uh, so uh, it seemed to me that that was in his mind. Didn't work. Uh, it might just be a lot more blatant with Zadari, but this idea that uh, obviously politicians often tend to operate in the gray areas, but in the public eye, we just see them as white and black. And Benazir is often seen as the daughter of the nation or the mother of the nation, depending on which generation. But at the end of the day, the legacy of the Bhutto is one of shrewd politicians who compromise when they needed to and uh, tried to do something when they could have rather than them either being angels or villains in our history. Yeah, of course. And, and, and isn't that what, how it normally is with politicians that, you know, they try and do some stuff, they fail to do some stuff, they're selfish, they're altruistic. I mean, it's, it's never as simple as people like to make out. And uh, I think that's true of Benazir. You know, there were many aspects to her personality and um, some are good, some are bad. Uh, but yeah, she was something, she was a powerful person. I know we're running out of time, but I had a really, I found an anecdote very interesting in your book, and I'd love for you to talk about that. The idea that uh, Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto always had a chip on his shoulder because mm. he might have felt the clan never thought of him as a true Bhutto. And there's so much talk now about Bilawal not being a true Bhutto, being a Zardari, but the idea that uh, Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto was born to a Hindu dancing girl and what that did to shape the personality of who he would become and arguably uh, the most popular Bhutto that has ever been. Uh, it's, it's almost crazy to now think about that the clan might have thought of him not being Bhutto enough. Yes, but they did. They did think that, uh, and and those who were close to him, the the old man, if you like, who I spoke to when preparing the book, were all clear that they did think that was an important aspect of his personality. Mm-hmm. And you know, he was obviously a very driven man. Uh, he was highly ambitious, and uh, he was obviously very very bright and charismatic. But all those nervous energy, all the nervous energy that he had that helped propel him to power uh, did have their roots, I think, in this issue of his status in the family and his uncertainty and, well, his determination to prove that he was as good as all of the rest of them, better than all of the rest of them, a genuine member of the family who could outshine them all indeed you know it it it, it was a it was an impetus it drove him i think to uh, some of his achievements and i think it was partly a result of the culture of sin you know where these things are so important and uh, it, for a, for a western child it may not matter quite as much that kind of background it wouldn't be seen as quite as problematic but uh, in the context of sindhi culture uh, it seemed to me that that was important and it did drive him. All in all, uh, as we bring this to a close, what do you think is the legacy of the Bhuttos? I think they you know, did bring a liberal language to Pakistani politics. I think they brought hope. Sulfagari Bhutto brought hope to many people who had no hope. And I think that's a you know, significant achievement. And they have introduced reform uh, from time to time, but clearly they've compromised in the world of politics to gather the resources they feel they need to fight the fight and to keep going and to, you know, play politics in Pakistan, which, frankly, everyone who does it needs money. I mean, you know, it, 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 it's, it's how it is. Uh, so, yeah, I think it's a mixed legacy. And as Pakistan moves, forward you know if you look at india and modi's success i mean it is so striking that you know an astonishingly powerful politician in the in the you know, in, in the whole of indian history you know, post post independence history you know started off as a tea boy in mumbai i actually went down to the place where he sold tea as a boy and uh, looked around and it's it's nothing it's a street corner in a outskirts of a busy city you know and he was able to propel himself to this supremely powerful position now and it's difficult to imagine someone in Pakistan doing that and and the the dynasties still have a grip 
on the political system that it looks like they're reasserting it just you know just, just now and i can see that as pakistan develops it may feel the need to move on uh, to politicians who've emerged from the body of the pakistani people rather than from the land holding elite or the corporate elite George Washington not being able to tell a lie, Modi being a tea seller. I think what uh, legacy remains are, is what is the stories that we tell, whether they be true or not. Uh, the policies are what we forget. But at the end of the day, what Zulfiqar Bhutto and Benazir made people feel, I think that is what they remember. Uh, thank you so much, Owen, for your time. And thank you for all the brilliant reporting uh, on Pakistan over these years. Uh, what would be your parting message to your entire Pakistani audience? <laughs> Oh, do, do I have a Pakistan? Well, I have your audience. And I'm very grateful uh, <laughs> yes. to, for you for you lending them for the for for an hour. And, and uh, I would well, I just say that um, I, I think you 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 live in the most um, interesting, hospitable, uh, lively, uh, fun, and uh, complicated place. Uh, that I've ever come across. And uh, it's been my huge pleasure to try to understand a bit of it. And I don't claim to understand it. But well, I have... we live here and we don't understand it. So we don't <laughs> exactly. <get> it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm in good company then. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. The Butter Dynasty by Owen Bennett Jones comes out in the US on April 19th. Get your book. Thank you so much. Get, get the book. Thank you so much for your time. And thank you for listening. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.